Hi, Sarah. Hi, Roger. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, and thank you for, for joining me today. Um, I think it's worth perhaps telling people a little bit who, who, who are not familiar with you about the background. You were born in the forest. Um, you left the forest and you've gone on to have this sort of amazing career, well, an international <laughs> career, because you've lived all over the world. You know, you've written for newspapers as a journalist. You're now quite a serious academic in publishing. And then um, quite, you know, interestingly to, the, to, to us who, who follow you, um, you've recently produ we produced two books. Um, the first, Shelter, a historical novel set in the forest during the Second World War, and more recently, you know, How to Belong, which has just been published and which we particularly want to talk about today. So, um, um, oh, and you're a Costa, Costa short story um, judge as well, aren't you? So That's that, right, yeah. 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 So, uh, is there anything that I've not covered, really, that is about you? No, that sounds perfect. Well, I mean, it sounds like somebody else. Um, but, yeah, I think that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, your first book, Shelter, um, you know, I absolutely loved it, you know, because I've got an interest in history. Um, and perhaps we could start there, go back to that book and just say, what, what inspired you to write a book about the forest? So what inspired me to write that book i always say i wrote that book out of rage which probably isn't how you should write books but um i started this book in 2012 and i had been very um exercised as i'm sure um loads of you were um by the government's plans to privatize um national forests basically which they were um, talking about a lot in 2011 um and so I'd written a piece for The Guardian sort of talking about having grown up in the Forest of Dean and just how a forest was a kind of living organic, um, you know, it was of the people as well as the place, you know, and it's hard to imagine something like that being sold out from under, you know, for me it's kind of as essential as air and I just couldn't imagine it. And when I, I'd written the piece and it had a really nice reception and I thought, I'm still furious, basically. And I'd also been trying, I'd written some um, terrible novels in my past and I'd wanted to sort of try quite seriously to write fiction. And somebody said to me, well, of course you'll write about the forest. And I thought, oh yeah, you know, I could write about this. And then I thought, nobody wants me to like rant on for 350 pages about, you know, the government and what, they, what they're trying to do with, to these um, places that belong to the people. Um, so I thought instead a bit more calmly about another time when it might have seemed that a perhaps well-intentioned government was making decisions about people's homelands um, when, you know, from a position of not really knowing and, and the Second World War came to mind because of course the forest as a place of timber production was under enormous pressure. There was a, a requirement for more and more timber. Um, all the men who knew how to sort of, you know, who knew forestry work had mostly, um, or quite a lot of them had either sort of um, volunteered for the, the war. So the population changed, the workforce changed. And of course, I mean, as you guys know, um, the population of the forest just increased exponentially because from these tiny villages, you know, lots of the men left, but then we had um, GIs and evacuees, you know, whole schools, so teachers coming in, um, there were army troops in, and then there were the um, land girls and the lumber gills, um, which is, uh, and the prisoners of war. So there were just all these really, really different sort of invasive species, if you like, entering this place, which had otherwise been very tight and close and lived its own life. Um, and I was just really, really interested in what that would have, you know, felt like. Really, it didn't seem so far away. I mean, so that's the other thing. You know, I was growing up in the seventies and eighties, and that was thirty years away. You know, my grandmother, my grandparents had lived through it. My dad was ten when the war ended. It didn't quite feel like history to me. It felt very kind of adjacent to my own life, I suppose. Thanks, Sarah. That, that's that's very interesting. Um, moving on to your new book, um, I've re read many sort of a synopsis of, of what, what you're trying to do in the book. Um, but it's got two very strong characters, Joe, uh, who's moved back to the forest, and Tessa. Would you like to 
give us a little um, summary of what, what the book's about? Sure. No, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do this there. This is this book, Forest Background in the book. Um, I have to say as well, this book makes me smile because of the cover, um, which has these beautiful trees on it. And um, when the publishers first showed me this, I said, oh, I didn't really, you know, I, I think this book isn't as much about the forest as Shelters, my first book. And my husband just sort of looked at me, you know, kind of shock. And he was like, this book is completely about the forest, which, um, I, you know, I was like, who knew that that was a thing? So this book is um, more about um, small towns, I suppose. So it's forest life, you know, we're not, we're not in the forest chopping down the trees in the same way. Um, but it's about um, two women, Jo, who is um, a barrister in her early um, late 20s, early 30s. And she's come back to the forest, as she said, um, she found barristering and life in London just not really what she was hoping for. And she's got this slightly romanticised idea of what home was like. You know, her parents ran um, the butcher shop that her grandfather had started and they were sort of at the centre of... Um, a community hub really and she just remembers it all in an absolutely rose-tinted um, way and when her parents decide to retire um, and move down to the coast she's distraught at the idea of this legacy being uh, sort of destroyed as she sees it so she um, leaves her job in the law and come back, comes back down to run the butcher's butch shop even though she is really really squeamish um, and she moves it in so she rents a room from a woman called Tessa, who's in her mid-40s. And she's also reasonably recently um, moved back to the forest after a, basically after a relationship that she self-sabotaged um, because she's, sort of, she's harbouring this secret. She has a, a medical condition that she's just unable to deal with, basically. And so she's harbouring a, a secret about her own life that... Um, makes her want to return and she's never found she's had the opposite experience of joe she doesn't find um, the community to be sort of warm and enveloping she considers it much more sort of threatening and intrusive actually as a place she she hasn't felt at the center of things um, and they're very different characters tess is a farrier you know she she acts rather than speaks um, you know all of her um, thinking comes through her hands and she's better with animals than she is with humans basically and um, Jo is essentially emotionally incontinent and just has to sort of be with people and try to fix things all the time and so really it's about what happens if you've got these two very different characters sort of reluctantly sort of living um, in the same space and also more widely about what community looks like and what happens um, to that these days you know and sort of the the gap the sort of, that sort of cognitive dissonance between what we want um, our lives to feel like and what they actually might be like yeah thank you yeah and um uh, i suppose it's interesting that you place joe on the edge of the forest and tessa's in the heart of the forest or closer to the middle of the forest so you know something about where they where they where they sit in relation to the woodland and what we call this traditional statutory forest i thought that was very interesting mm, thank you. Um, well here's a here's a funny thing i don't know if you spotted this um but when i started to write this book i, I had that kind of complete fear of the blank page i was like I've got to go again and i've got to go until i've got you know ninety thousand words and it just felt um overwhelming and I'm the sort of person that I think if I was a painter, I would never be able to paint abstract stuff. I'd need the vase or the tree or whatever in front of me. And I, I'm the same-ish when I write fundamentally. So I thought, well, write with something you know. And Tessa's cottage, where Joe also lives, um, is a, sort of, they spend a lot of time in that. You know, lots of things happen in it. And I thought, I will, I will make Tessa's cottage Amos's cottage from shelter. So basically... The, so I can describe that house. I know what that house looks like because I spent you know ninety thousand words in that house in a different book. And so although the two books aren't connected at all, they're just kind of little Easter egg in as much as it's the same yeah. cottage. And at one point somebody says an old shepherd lived here at some point or something, and that's that. So um, yeah, I suppose I connected them like that just to get it going. Okay. Um, I can we just talk for a moment about your, your, your heroes? Because um, I, I find them completely fascinating characters. When I say heroes, I'm talking about the lead characters in your books. We've got uh, Connie, 
in the shelter <laughs> who's uh, who's just you know the most sort of in your face sort of person who's really challenging and uh, um, uh, uh, quite brilliant. Uh, and then you've got Joe and Tessa who are equally sort of interesting characters. Um, you know, with their, who, 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 and all these people are trying to make sense of the world and their lives for each other, for themselves um, in particular. But, uh, you know, one, one thing that's, that's, that's common again is this idea that their presence is set in what are traditionally dominated male enclaves, mm. you know, places of work. Um, and I know you've reported on that. And is, is that something that's important to you, reporting on these sort of shifting gender boundaries and new opportunities for women? doing work that I, perhaps I hadn't done before. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I also think lots of that probably always did happen just because, you know, the men were sent off to war or whatever, you know, in Connie's case. But that we should, you know, we should be able to be gender blind a bit about these jobs. And so, and I'm also quite contrary, I think. So it sort of didn't occur to me that they would need to do women's jobs. You know, I'm really interested in the idea of, um, of, of gendered jobs, you know, and that if I say a butcher, we'll all think of a man, even though there's absolutely no reason. But if I say um, someone who works in the shop, we'll probably all think of a woman. Yeah. You know, so and it's daft, isn't it, really? There's just something about meat that feels more masculine. So um, I think in a very, very, very early, not even an iteration of this book, but I had a, a notebook where I keep ideas and um, I'd written timid butcher because I just thought the idea of a timid butcher was really funny and it might have been at some point I assumed that that would be a man but then once I started to engage with this book and realized that Joe could be the timid butcher it was like well obviously that's a woman and I just think yeah it's really important that we represent things differently and that you know if people are remarking upon that then we do also stop and think well why is that so surprising why shouldn't that and I spoke to so um, I've got a, a local farrier and who took me out for the day to show me you know what the work is like and he's you know got friends who are female farriers and i thought well that's fine you know if it's plausible if it's not completely ridiculous then i think it's really important that we represent that yeah yeah and why you you explained you've answered my next question really which is about farriery but why why uh, why why a butcher's shop why, why, <laughs> why was that a setting for you did that have any resonance with yourself and in, in the past or anything or is it just a not really. I think it was literally that I just at some point had thought, wouldn't it be funny to write about a timid butcher? I feel like there, there could be something in there that, you know, the sort of the need to earn a living could be, you know, in complete opposition to your sort of core values of beliefs and abilities. Um, and because I wanted Joe to come back from, you know, I'm really interested in the um, the gap that can be caused if you're sort of educated out of your environment, fundamentally, um, which is what happens to Jo in a way, you know, in order to kind of use her brain, it's felt that she needs to leave. Um, and so she's doing this very cerebral job. Um, and so then I wanted something that was that sort of juxtaposed completely with that. Um, and so butchery felt like the opposite of the law, I suppose, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think leading from that, I had this sense that um, with with your characters, um, Connie had me on the edge of my seat at the end of the book. <laughs> you know, come back to the forest, come back to the forest. <laughs> I don't want to spoil it for people, but she had all sorts of aspirations. Um, uh, and, and, and in your latest book, I was left with the sense that uh, um, Tessa's uh, challenges and dilemmas were around uh, relationships. And in some way, in the way you finished that book, it was a, a potential resolution to that. For Joe, and I don't, this is a, a spoiler warning, um, you know, I think the last reference to it, she was looking into a cupboard um, a little blankly. And I, I thought, I thought, well, you know, when I, when you reflect on the people you've got to know through a book and one as beautifully written as yours, you left thinking, well, what, what did they do next? What did Katie do next? What did they do next? Yeah. And Joe was still a, a bit of a, you know, was hanging there for me. And I suppose um, uh, I've got two questions, if I can, Sarah. Yeah, cool. and both of them are horribly unfair. Is the, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the first one is, is which of these three characters, you know, do you feel most resonates with Sarah? You know, oh, that's a vicious question, isn't it? <laughs> 
And then the second one, the second one is that is that is that um, I suppose what did happen to Joe? <laughs> so they're really, really unfair. I'll tell you one of those things. Um, so do you, I suppose they're all bits of me. That's the answer. Well, actually, I'm really because I'm not a quiet, still person, and I just think it looks amazing. I'm really, really interested in the kind of pathology of um, of people who are sort of naturally quite um, private. You know, I, I wish that I were more like that quite often, but I, I think it's really interesting. You know, the whole still waters runs deep thing, I suppose. And so with Tessa, I was really, and and again, without sort of spoiling, spoilering the book, um, Tessa has, and we, we learn you know, more about this, but, but at the beginning of the book, it, it's apparent Tessa's got a, an issue, a medical issue, whereby if she's exposed to emotion, um, she goes into complete bodily collapse. So, you know, if she laughs or she's frightened or somebody says something offhand and startles her, her body, um, to protect her, just um, the muscles collapse, basically. So she falls to the ground, she's conscious, but she falls to the ground. So as a consequence, she's um, learned to live her life in a, the smallest way possible, just to kind of protect herself from this. And I was really interested in the pathology of that because I, you know, I don't know how to live my life um, except outwardly. And um, I think, so I was sort of interested in that as a kind of, could I write that? I found Tessa quite hard to write. And I think some people find her quite hard to engage with because she's someone who's not showing her emotions. And it turns out that's an impossible thing to write as well. You know, if someone's not expressing their emotions, how do you make them? I don't think every character needs to be likable, but you need to be able to somehow empathize with them on some way. Um, with Connie, so from Shelter, I went to a, a book event um, when the paperback came out for Shelter and somebody put her hand up and said, um, did you like Connie? Because I don't. <laughs> and the rest, it was a book group in a bookshop and the woman who read it said, Marie, you can't ask that. And I said, well, I'm really pleased. I said, did you like any of the other characters? And she said, yeah, 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 I just hated Connie. And I said, well, then that's fine because, you know, as long as you aren't hating the whole book and it hasn't been a horrible experience for you, I want, I think I, again, I'm not, I, I hope I'm not as contrary as Connie, but I find it really compelling, this idea that you would just be driven to do what the hell you wanted, you know, a little bit. And that, that urge to not be boxed in would be your driving force. And that, you know, and people talk about difficult women, don't they, more than they talk about difficult men. And, you know, Certainly in the 40s, Connie would have been a really difficult woman. Mm -hmm. And then Joe, I mean, I suppose, you know, in some respects, you know, my friends tease me that, that Joe is more like me because she's somebody who left um, and, you know, at the beginning of the book hasn't come back. And I think that might have been in some respects sort of wish fulfillment in literary form. But I don't think I'm quite like Joe. I mean, it might be that, you know, I'm more, I was more like Joe when I was Joe's age, but I I don't know. I think they're all just ways of exploring different things. Yeah. That was the first question. No, Second I... question, what happens to Joe, whatever you want? That's up to you <laughs> now. That's in. That's for the reader. Great answer. Um, but in that, in the answer to the first unfair question, you, <laughs> you, use the term, you use the term difficult men. Yeah. And I suppose as a reader and as a man, when I read How to Belong, I thought, I, just thought, I did think, that most of the men in it were quite troubled. Um, and the, 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 the uh, Joe's friend, and you know, he was obviously resentful of a success. Also resentful of a, and I thought that was an interesting idea, of a, of a going out of the forest and then coming back and her motives and all sorts of things. And, a lot, and I thought that was a very interesting perspective on looking, coming back as well as looking back. Mm. Uh, and then perhaps my other character who, who I, who, who, you, you, you really portrayed as quite a bleak figure it was Ron. And Ron couldn't cope with diversity or anything. He couldn't cope with the change, with the shop. He couldn't cope with a woman taking charge of it. You know, he was, and also there was a, a reference to, uh, you know, him having issues about same sex relationships. So there was this mm. sense that men were, men in it, you know, aren't coping with change, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, is that, I, that, is that a fair observation? And, and is, it, <laughs> is that a, is that what you observe about the Forest of Dean? The men struggling with some of these changes is that I don't. Well, so I think 
men have, I mean, so I've got two sons and a husband, and so I spend a lot of my time around men, and I don't, I think men have got a hard, like, there's a lot that's changing, you know, whether they want to or not. I don't think at all that that was a kind of forest-specific thing, although I do think, certainly Ron, who's, you know, sort of older and quite set, I think it might be more of a small community thing. I mean, I live in a, um, a sort of, a small town big village um, where I live now and um, there was literally in the parish magazine so our butcher shop um, which is fantastic and which you know took me in to show me how to make sausage so that I could write about it in the book um, they changed ownership I don't know it was seven or eight years ago and it was written up in the parish magazine that um, the and they literally said I've got the clipping somewhere but they, they said um, it was noted that the counter had been moved it used to run along the left hand side of the shop and it had been moved so now it ran along the right hand side and it said despite the moving of the counter from the left hand side to the right hand side the dread fear of discernible change has not come to pass and i was like wow you know they moved the counter in the butchers and this is the dread fear of discernible change and it makes the parish magazine and you know and that wasn't the forest at all that's where i live now and i was just like oh feelings run deep about these things in these places where people have lived all their lives and you don't mess around with it and so I think I was channeling some of that into Ron um, although interestingly forest friends who've read it sometimes say he's a proper forester in that kind of slightly pig-headed way and I say that because I'm you know I am one by you know blood and training and you know I think Ron Ron more than so Joe's friend Liam you know has his own challenges and I think could never have had her, you know, he because he he was always going to have to stay home. And I think what I wanted to explore then was what it's like, not just for the person who's left, but for the people that have been left behind and what that shows you. And if you go away, then you're going away with everybody's expectations of that being something that people like us can do. And when you come back and say, actually, it's no better out there, then, then that just closes everybody's worlds back in, potentially, I think. So it was more small towns in particular in general than the forest in particular, I think, sir. Yeah. Yeah. And I I I I, I suppose um you, you being uh, as you always are, you've been generous about the forest and, and the people that live here because you're very loyal and you're very you're very generous. But I think I think that my reflection is it's a fair observation, but I think <laughs> I think we're it's we're still in a very paternalistic culture, and uh, the, the, some of these these new boundaries, people are still working through them. Um, and I think it's we're still you know getting through a lot of things about race and gender that, that perhaps uh, you know are about change. And I think people are, are getting there, but it, but it's taking a little bit of time. And interestingly, I think from uh, you know the, the one of the things that you wrote this book at a pivotal time and the. Seven Bridge is no longer got a toll. And that, That's think, right. Well, yeah. I wanted to make sure it felt like the fo- it felt enough like the forest to people who know the forest well. Without, I mean, interestingly, I don't name the town. So in in shelter, I named things quite specifically, and then I apologised to foresters because I said, you know, I I believe that I've got the topography right, but I know that I haven't got the geography right. You know, though you could walk between things in ten minutes that were sort of ten miles apart and things because I was using the beauty of the forest and different sort of um, landscape parts um, in a way. Whereas this time, I knew my way out, you know, I could describe where Joe would, Joe's drive from the cottage to the butcher shop because in my head I knew which road I was on, but I deliberately didn't name any of it to give myself a bit more license. Um, and interestingly, again, people who've read it, who know the forest well and know me, um, have made assumptions about which town it is, which aren't the, aren't the town I had in my head, just because they would assume that's where I'd put things. And I think, to a degree, you describe things in a general and a specific enough way. You know, I could I could have, I don't know, Lydney, Colford, Cinderford, and to a degree, there would be things I could describe about all of them that would sound the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very interesting. Um, I I think uh, I. My, I, I want to, I would encourage people to read the book because I think it's a, it's a terrific well, thank book. You. And I think it comes at a time when the forest is changing in all sorts of ways. 
and it helps people think about those changes and their place in them and so forth. So I think it's really, it's, it's, it's excellent. Uh, and I'd recommend anybody to, to read it, um, you know, apart from being a really good story. Um, I think it has that, that, that presence of the moment we're in, in the forest today. I suppose uh, to, to finish, Sarah, uh, I'm, you know, there's a, I, I, I've asked you so many unfair questions. I'm a bit reluctant yeah. to talk about your aspirations in terms of um, uh, moving back to the forest, because some of us would love to see you back here. Um, but I suppose if you did, and um, you've had these three characters in your books, um, both of which, all of which I've enjoyed reading about. But, um, you know, you've got the thinker, you've got the lawyer, who's the thinker, you've got the farrier, you know, who's very introspective, you know, hardworking. And of course, you've got Connie, you know, you know, she, she was, she was, you know, a storm of a character. Um, I suppose in terms of if you came back, you're this successful author. So if you came to plonk yourself right in the middle of the forest um, uh, and come, you know, what, what would you want to be? What would you like to do? Um, if you could, you know, if you were starting again, what would you do? Would you be an author? Oh, if I came back? Yeah, I'd want to come back like this and say, look, you don't have to leave to do this. You can stay here. You can stay here and do this. Because I think it took me such a long time to write because, you know, that narrative wasn't necessarily out there. That you can stay, this is, you know, I still completely believe and I was doing a thing for Black Holes yesterday and the um, the girl who was doing the video just stopped and laughed at me because I said, you know, it's the most beautiful place in the world. Um, and I still, you know, it's completely got my heart, the forest. It, it always will. And I wouldn't want to come back as anything other than me because, you know, it's the forest that made me into me. It really was. Um, and I think to come back and write would be a way of saying you don't have to go away and write. I suppose. So we'd have to find you a writer's cabin. <laughs> Would you? Yeah. Yeah. That's just you... Like, yeah. I mean, I've got two small children, well, two teenage boys who I don't think would, you know, take very kindly to being uprooted um, right now. But that's not to say that I don't harbour those fantasies most days. But... Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're just grateful to have such a great writer, have an interest in the forest, write oh. what you do about it. And uh, the point you were making there about, um, uh, you know, inspiration and confidence, you'll know that in reading The Forest, that's one of our aspirations is to give people, you know, a voice, confidence, and you're a terrific role model. So thank you ever so much, Sarah. Well, wow, thank you. I just think the work that you guys do with reading The Forest is incredible. And I'm so, you know, grateful to be involved in any small way that I can be, really. So thank you.